Okay, suppose you're walking down Bruin Walk. Imagine this situation. Somebody of the opposite sex, we'll, we'll say they're of average attractiveness, comes up to you and they say, hi, I've been noticing you around campus lately. I find you very attractive. W would you go out with me tonight? I want you to write down what, what your answer would be. Just say, that's all they say. I've been noticing you around campus. I find you attractive. Would you go, would you go out with me tonight? They're, they're average attracted. Are they a point eight? You, you have to decide what average is. All right, have you written your answers down? I'm going to look. <laughs> All right. Now erase that. Uh, start over. You're walking down Bruin Walk. You're coming back from LS15. Somebody of the opposite sex approaches you, average attractiveness, and they say again, Hi. I've been noticing you around campus. I find you very attractive. Would you come, come over to my apartment tonight? Hey. Just give me a yes or no. I'll write it down. All right, now erase that from, from your mind. Third and final scenario. You're leaving LS15 feeling good, you've learned some stuff. So one of the opposite sex comes up to you on Bruin Walk. They say, hi, I've been noticing you around campus. I find you very attractive. Would you have sex with me tonight? Yes or no, write down your answer. You're not the first people that these questions have, I'm not, I'm not gonna have you reveal your answer. Uh, this is a famous study, it's called the, the Casual Sex Study. Okay, and so for our first one here, would you go out with me tonight? How many of you said yes? How many of you are too embarrassed to admit that you said yes? All right, that's good. Here's what, here's what we get in, in a study when this study is done. About 50-50. I know, think about those results. If you've been afraid to ask somebody out, those are pretty good odds, right? This study uh, has been done in a few different places, but it was originally done uh, in Michigan, and I like it because my friend Judith was one of the, the people who actually did it. She had to go out and pretend that, that she was asking someone uh, to go out with her. Uh, all right, next one, what do you think we got here? Come over to my apartment tonight. 69% of the males said yes. <laughs> if you're a guy, this is not such a good strategy. Just don't, don't be so aggressive so fast. Only 6% said yes. Then we get to the last one. What's that? No, no, it's of the females. So 6% of the females said yes. 94% of the females said no. Uh, 69 and 31. So what do, you, what do you think here? Have sex with me tonight? No, think, think about it. I mean, you have to think about your own behavior. We had 75% of the males said yes. 0% of the females said yes. I think something that was interesting in this study, too, that Judith told me when she would ask, she's above average attractiveness, but they, they claimed she was average. 
she said when she asked guys this question, the guys who said no, she said not many of them, but the, the guys who said no almost always apologized to her too. They're like, sorry, I have a girlfriend or you know, I'd really like to, but blah, 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 blah. Uh, on the other hand, the guys who had to do this, uh, as you can imagine, almost universally, not only was the answer no, but, but the females were offended that, that it was a rude question to, to ask. So these aren't super surprising to us, right? But it's a dramatic difference. And this is one of the things we're going to start talking about. We talked about hormones last time, and I showed you how males and females could have pretty different behaviors when it came to object memory. We saw females, even in our class, uh, were significantly better than males. We saw that at mental rotations, males were better than females. We know that there are some differences. We also analyzed some of the the experimental ways that you can look at that. And we saw that as your testosterone levels got higher, the things that males uh, were better at than females, they improved. As uh, estrogen levels went up, either in different females or at different times of your life or at different times of your cycle, we saw that, that for those behaviors, uh, females became even better than, than they already were uh, during those times. So what we're gonna do this time, we're gonna look at this question of why do we have those differences? So I've, I've written the first step on our outline here, we're built differently. This is pretty obvious, but the fact that it leads to a bunch of different implications uh, that are pretty dramatic, I think is, is something that, that you may not have thought about before. So in today's lecture and on Thursday, we're gonna explore this. We're gonna try and figure out why is it that males and females uh, are different in how they think, in how they feel, in how they behave, in how they respond to questions that somebody asks them on Bruin Walk. We want to look into that and see why, is, why that is. So let's talk about that, how we're built differently. So we could say this. Whoops, I did have some pictures. Uh, this is obvious that we're built differently here. This is my uh, picture I had for the casual sex study. That's not Judith, though. I don't have any pictures of her. Um, Okay, so step one in terms of being built differently, males and females, and I'm going to focus primarily on mammals, although we'll talk about a lot of other animals as well. We'll look at some uh, bird data, some reptile and amphibian data. We'll look at insect data. But let's just lay out what the obvious differences are between males and females and then explore what that means. So how, how is female reproductive investment initially greater? Well, looking at this picture gives away one of, one of the uh, reasons why it's greater. Do you know that how they actually define male and female? This is something from the time you're, you're a tiny kid, you know who's a boy and who's a girl, who's male and who's female. But biologists have a specific way of defining. If you see a new species, you know, you see some dragonfly, how do you decide which one's a male, which one's a female? If you see uh, a species of fish and the defining feature of male and female is how big is the gamete? Any species that has two sexes, and most of them do, one species produces a large gamete, the other produces a small gamete. The big gamete uh, determines who the female is, and the smaller gamete is the male. So for starters, I got a couple here. Uh, number two, size of gamete. The female egg on average is about 400 times bigger in females than in males. They're pretty small as it is, but that's a dramatic difference in investment initially. So at the outset, in terms of producing a new offspring, females have done a lot more of the work. We've also got lactation, uh, which is a tremendous investment in mammals. We've got gestation as well. These are, these are the three primary differences that females produce a bigger gamete, females get pregnant and have to carry the offspring, and then off, after the offspring is born, females have to nurse it. Let's say you want to be a good male uh, and you're a you know, paramiscus polyanotis, the old field mouse, and let's say you want to be you know, kind of a liberated male dad old field mouse, and you want to take care of the offspring. What do you do during those first few weeks of life? How do you take care of the offspring? <coughs> no, they don't eat food in the first stages. Protect it, 
Eh, there's not much protection you can do. Uh, they live in burrows. Something's either going to get in there or not. They can't fight off any of their predators. What can you do? Take care of the mom. Eh, she just kind of has to sit there. And what is, what is she doing? How is she taking care of the offspring? She's lactating. She's nursing them. All of the nourishment for the offspring comes from the mother. No matter how badly the male wants to help, he can't. There's nothing he can do. At an earlier stage, too, what if he decided, hey, that's not right that you have to carry around this entire litter of offspring. Let me help. He can't. Every one of these steps is very important. I put the word up here. I hate writing the outline on the board because it's really hard to write. And so I want to cut out any word I can, especially a long word like that. But I can't. It's necessarily female. Females make most of the investment, and they can't get out of it. It's not an option. That's just how it is. What this means, then, is this. Are you familiar with the, the phrase opportunity costs? Yeah, OK, from economics, yes. What is opportunity costs? I think about this uh, after revealed preference. It's my second favorite economic idea. What are opportunity costs? Any idea? What you have to give up to. Yeah, that's. That, Yeah, that's perfect. It's whatever you have to give up to do something else. So any time you make a decision to do something, you could have been doing something else. And whatever you give up, there is some value to that that you have to realize uh, that you're paying. So it's the opportunity cost. So I think about uh, female reproductive success being constrained by opportunity cost, meaning this. Once she's pregnant, she can't get pregnant again. Like she can only be pregnant once at a time. On the other hand, if a, a, a male gets a female pregnant, can he get another female pregnant? Yes. And another one? Yes. And another one? Yes. There is no opportunity cost in terms of reproduction for, for the male. So this is enough to consider it. Take home message number one, that early nurturing of the child and embryos necessarily female dominated, primarily in mammals. Describing it this way seems like it's unfair, right? Seems like somehow the females are getting the, the short end of the stick, but it's not. They're just differences. From the male perspective, tell me something that is a function of the fact that we're built differently. Uh, what's a feature of being male? When you are a female, she's got to make that decision. OK, should I take her of this offspring? Or should I try and have another offspring? She knows that baby is hers. The defining feature about us being built differently from the male perspective is this. If you're a male, you can never, ever be certain that the baby is yours. It's called paternity uncertainty. And because you have, in the case of mammals, you have fertilization occurs inside the females. Gestation is inside the females. He cannot be certain that it was his sperm that fertilized the egg. And so when she gives birth, the offspring physically come out of her. She has 100% certainty that they're her hers. So as she is taking care of them, that investment is good. If the male, on the other hand, takes care of offspring, but it turns out that uh, genetically they belong to some other male that she also mated with, from an evolutionary perspective, that's disastrous because he's not increasing his reproductive success and there are opportunity costs of taking care of those offspring. So there's a lot of evolutionary pressure we're going to see on him to be wary about making the investment because he has paternity uncertainty and he has opportunity costs. All right, so we're going to explore these things uh, in some detail. So, oops, I've skipped all these. So you can see the male does compensate somewhat uh, for producing the smaller gamete by producing lots of them. We have a single egg, lots of sperm trying to fertilize it. Uh, here we are up super close. Uh, but here, this is a human sperm and egg, so you get a good sense of the difference in investment to produce them. In terms of taking care of the offspring, here we have, uh, I don't know what species it is, some kind of rodent in the wild. But how many offspring? We got about one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Almost certainly there are a lot more underneath her. They have litters for anywhere from between six and 12 offspring, uh, and they'll have them once a month in the case of most wild mice. So a female mouse will produce her weight in offspring about every month. Think about that, producing, let's say you're female in this class and you weigh 120 pounds, producing 120 pounds of offspring this month and then 120 pounds of offspring next, next month and then 120 pounds of offspring the next month. It's a huge investment. And as we said, the male can't really help out there uh, even if he wants to. Here we have a female again nursing. Energetic calculations show that the cost of lactation is about the same or more than the cost of the gestation. So the pregnancy is very expensive energetically, maybe 140,000 calories, but lactation can be the same. Here we have, this is a uh, red kangaroo. They're marsupials and they're born uh, at a state uh, that is really poorly developed. Now, do you know the word uh, precocious, what it means? Pretty common word, right? Precocious means you're relatively advanced for your age. So you might say, kid, wow, the kid's really precocious. Uh, a word that's used in, in biology for a lot of mammals is altricial. It's a GRE word, but you can impress your friends. Altricial means the opposite. It means very, very poorly developed. So you can uh, uh, make fun of your roommate by, by saying, wow, you're so altricial. Uh, and they'll, they'll think that it's related to altruism or something like that. It just means that they're poorly developed for their age. Uh, so these are very, very, uh, they're born in an altricial stage, but they still, this one, they attach to the, this nipple and they just feed for a long, 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 long period of time. So the mother is still making the investment. Uh, same thing here in the wild. If you see offspring with their, their parent, almost always the, the mother, that's because A, she's the one who's lactating and B, she has 100% maternity certainty. The male doesn't. And so that is why uh, natural selection says, well, if you have the option between taking care of the offspring that might not be yours and trying to have other offspring, that might be the better way to go. There's a little baby zebra just born, same thing, always being taken care of by the mother. Uh, you look at chimp offspring, they're all gonna be uh, hanging out with their mother. Uh, females uh, in humans, we'll talk about them, that we're, we're not so much like all the other mammals, but another primate. All right, let's look at Let's look at some data. I like data. Uh, some, an experiment was done in fruit flies. And here's what they did in this experiment. They said, let's take a male and we're gonna put him into a little test tube. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in a female and we're gonna see how many offspring he produces. And we're gonna plot that on the graph. Then we're gonna take another male and we're gonna put him in a tube, but we're gonna put two females in there. We're gonna count how many offspring he produces. Then we're gonna put another male in a tube with three females. And we're gonna see how many offspring he produces. What do you think the graph looks like? Looks like this. Produces about 30 offspring, anywhere from 30 to 60 if he gets one. You put in another female, goes up to 90. You put in another female, goes up to 120. You can keep putting females in there and his reproductive success keeps going up. Now what if you do the same experiment but you flip it around? It's a female in there and you put one male in. Then you put two males in. What happens uh, if she's got access maybe to three males? Not eventually. After one, she's got all the sperm she needs. Second guy, he's not helping her. Third one, not helping her. The study was done in fruit flies, but it could be done in almost any species. The numbers are a little more dramatic here. Uh, sorry, this is the worst overhead. We can have the top focused or the bottom focused. I could give you some more data. This one's sort of silly because it almost conveys the opposite point. But if you look even at the extremes in, in humans for how many offspring they can produce, who do you think can produce more offspring, a male or a female? Lifetime maximum reproductive success? Obviously a male, right? What are the numbers, though? 
for a female, this Russian woman had 69 babies. Uh, it boggles the mind to figure it out. Uh, no single births, lots of twins, triplets, and quadruplets. Uh, it's sadly comical that the Guinness Book of Records doesn't even have her name. They call her Mrs. Fyodor Vasilev. Uh, but anyway, that's the high for her. For males, uh, and this is debated, but allegedly the Mule Ismail, the bloodthirsty, produced 888 offspring. These are absurd, uh, but they make the point that the capacity in males is a lot higher than the capacity is in females. We all know this. Why? Because we're built differently. Early nurturing is necessarily female. Females have to get pregnant and their opportunity costs. Females have to nurse the offspring. Males can move on and they can fertilize multiple different individuals. But again, we don't know uh, if they are his. So we've got the paternity certainty. And so in all the thinking about male-female differences in humans, it's all going to stem from, from this. What are the implications of females having to invest more? What are the implications of males not being able to invest as much? What are the implications of females having perfect certainty that the baby is theirs? What are the implications of males never having uh, paternity certainty? So our second take-home message is this. Once you've got that first mating, if you're a female, additional matings don't help you out so much. If you're a male, additional matings are always valuable. Question. Good question. Does this mean that evolutionarily speaking, women love their child more? Quote unquote. Yes. You thought I was going to hedge on that, didn't you? No, it's true. Uh, it depends on how you categorize love. Um, I th and I'm answering, on average, across, if, if we look and, and we, we define love as giving up things in order to, to offer things to the offspring, on average, yes, females do more. That, that seems terrible for me because I love my son. I take care of him certainly as much as his mother. But on average, we know that males are more likely to desert. Males are more, less likely to uh, offer care. So yes. That was a depressing question. All right, here's a question for you. Think about this. I can't remember if I, I asked you. Maybe I asked you in a different con context. It's the average number of heterosexual sex partners over a person's life, larger for males or females. Why don't we do it this way instead? Write down, what do you think is the average number of sexual partners, heterosexual sexual partners that a male will have over the course of his life? Or you, you don't have to write it down, you can tell me if you want. What do you think the number is? What do you think? <laughs> you can take a guess. What do you, you have a number in mind? 10? That's, a, that's what people tend to say on average, about 10. What do you think is the average number of heterosexual partners uh, for a female over the course of her life? Five, six, seven? Wow. How many? Three. Three turns out to be the most common number that people say when they, they do surveys. Now here's something that if you really concentrate, give me this, if you're gonna only focus for a few minutes in lecture, focus right now, because this, this can blow your mind. Imagine this. Let's say every person has a little counter, you know, that they click on their belt each time they have a new sexual partner, and the number goes up by one. If a male, who we're gonna say the average number of new partners is 10, each time he has sex with someone new, click, his counter goes up. But because it's someone new, her counter's going up too, click. So that when we take all the numbers of the females and we add them up and divide by how, how many there are, guess what? The number has to be the same. The average number of partners that a male has over his lifetime has to be equal to the average number that a female has. Here's the crazy thing, the numbers you gave me, 10, Three, those are what we get when you actually ask people how many sexual partners have you had in your lifetime? So what does that tell us? Liars. Women are liars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what else does it tell us? Men are liars. This is one of the most important things you'll learn about 
uh, survey data, a lot of psychology studies, biology studies as well. If you ask people to self-report, men will lie, women will lie. Recently, a book came out, and it was about a seven or 800-page book that purported to be a compendium of the most exhaustive survey on what American males and females are doing in the bedroom. Pages and pages of their responses to these survey questions, analysis of them. But on one of the first pages, it says, for, for our survey, we got the average for males was just over 10, 10.1. The average for females was about 3.5. And so what do I do to a book like this? I throw it away because it is not helpful because the one piece of data that I can verify whether or not people are lying or telling the truth, I know with certainty they're lying. And so it really undermines your ability to evaluate what people have said. Now, right now, your brain is going, no, no, it can't be, though. No, the first time I learned this, I really I had to sit down. I just wrote down a bunch of my friends' names and uh, people that they had had sex with. And I started doing the crosses, and I was counting them up. Uh, it's really true. If you don't believe me, you're going to have to go home and uh, do the calculations. But this makes an important point for us. And it's this. The average has to be the same, but the variance in reproductive success can differ between males and females. What does the variance mean? Probably the only experience you have with variance in a repeated way has to do with exams, right? It gets reported what, what the average score on an exam is. But if I say the average score on the exam was 75%, What's the difference if I say it was 75% plus or minus 2, or I say it was 75% plus or minus 80? How does that influence your perception of it? Because most people got the same, so lower variance. Lower variance means everybody was clustered right around 75. If it's 75 plus or minus 80, it means there were people who got 5, who got 7, who got 100, and the scores are all over the place. And so for number of sex partners over the course of your life, the mean has to be the same, but the variance doesn't. So what does this mean? It could mean, it could mean maybe that some males have sex with lots of women, but some males, lots of males don't have sex with any. And so if you have a bunch that the number is 20 and a bunch that the number is zero, when you add in all those zeros and you add in the big number, the variance gets really high. On the other hand, in the case of females, maybe the number is, uh, I, I assume that the true number is probably somewhere exactly between. I'm going to assume that males and females are lying equally. So I'll take the midpoint. I'll say it's probably somewhere around seven, six and a half. And so maybe all females are right around there and males, there, there is some variance. To study this, we've already kind of talked about this, uh, so I say there is a mean and standard deviation of reproductive success. The mean has to be the same, but the standard deviation isn't. I think it's most helpful when we think about this to look at an example of a species where the numbers are kind of extreme. And for that, I want to look at elephant seals. We write a lot about elephant seals in mean genes because uh, I just think they're, they're a an interesting example because their, their reproductive system is so, is so extreme. Here's, here's what we know about them. That males, uh, and you can see these on the coast of California, uh, just uh, south of San Francisco, there's a good place where you can go right on the beach. And what happens is, is this. Around December, you get a bunch of males who arrive The males arrive, and they start fighting with each other to establish who's the toughest, meanest, most dominant male. And their battles are, are pretty ruthless. They'll uh, move up against each other. They'll bite. Uh, they make lots of loud noises. A good-sized male is almost the size of this counter in the front. They're a little bit shorter and a little bit fatter. Uh, but they can weigh as much, I, I forget what I said in mean genes, I think I said like the, the size of a, a Cadillac, so you know, several thousand pounds. So the males 
show up in December, the females aren't there, they start fighting to control the beach, they'll go without food until March. All they focus on is fighting or mating, but they establish a dominance hierarchy. This takes about a month. So this is relatively early in the breeding season. I know this because the males are not particularly scuffed up. If you look later, look at the fronts of them. They get uh, bloody, they get all scarred. That is a good sized male there. Uh, and all those other things around them, they're, they're all elephant seals. So sometimes they look like rocks, but uh, this is early on. So this is December. Uh, and man, this is probably later because you've got some, some young offspring. But the males are still fighting. So you've got three males here fighting, trying to establish who's more dominant than, uh, than the other. In January, females arrive. They start coming up on the beach, and they're ready to mate. The females want to mate with the best male. And they define the best male as the most dominant male the one who controls a nice part of the beach where they can lay out, take care of their offspring that they're giving birth to from the previous year. In, ma in elephant seals, there's huge variance in male reproductive success. There's another battle you can see. Why would they exert so much effort in this battle? Because from an evolutionary perspective, there is a huge reward to winning. Here we have a, a male uh, getting ready to mate with a female. It's not very graceful. Uh, but the top 4% of the males end up getting about 85% of the matings. That top male, those top 4%, they can have more than 50 offspring in a year. They can have as many as 200 offspring. So the reproductive success is tremendous. If you're not in the top 4% of males, what's your reproductive success look like? It's very, very bad. The females don't want to mate with you. The males provide almost no parental care. So the female mates with the top male. She chooses who he is. Because the male is never going to provide any care for her after that, she just mates with him and goes on you know, about her business. So she just wants to get the best guy. The other 96% of the males tend to just sit offshore and tread water for the entire winter. Here's a happy couple. Uh, brief a uh, little bit. These are all elephant seals along here. And so if you are one of the dominant males, you uh, can have reproductive success with all of them. But most males never copulate, ever, in their entire life. What's the most that females can reproduce? What's the most that females can reproduce? Every female reproduces once each, each year. She'll come back, and she probably will the next year. So this is the case where if we were to keep track of how many partners does each male have, when we look at our data, it'll be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 78, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. If we look at the females, it's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And on average, it turns out to be the same, but the variance for the males is really high. The variance for the females is really low. It's all the same. Looked at this one. Again, this is a good-sized male, though. You get a sense. You'd think that they'd be slow. They're actually really fast if they get going, and it's very dangerous. People uh, think, oh, they're just you know, sort of these slothful things. They'll move, and they, they can hurt people. Uh, you don't want to get in their way. Uh, sorry, my cheesy human slide. Uh, because I wanted to remember that People have looked at variance in reproductive success in humans, and one good study was done uh, in this society that was relatively isolated, so you didn't have people coming in and coming out. Here's what they found. For females, I'll just show both of them at the same time. These were, they're called the uh, Javante Indians in Brazil. And among females, it's divided up this way. Almost none of them had zero offspring. A lot of them had... Uh, one child, this is maybe 7%, 8%. Uh, some of them had two children, some had three, some had four, some had five, and then it just kind of drops off. Among the males, 
higher percent had zero, a very high percent had one, but then you had uh, two, three, four, five, six, but then you come down here and at nine and 11, 23 kids, you have a few there. So it's, it's nowhere near as dramatic as it is for the elephant seals. But if you count up the numbers, you find that the average is 3.6 for both, but the variance was 3.9 for females, the variance in males was 12.1. So a lot of people, when they'll describe how males and females difference, differ among mammals when it comes to breeding, it somehow seems like, wow, you know, uh, the males are, are having sort of this, this crazy uh, sexual lifestyle, but that's not it. It's really good from a reproductive success perspective to be the top male. It's really good to be almost any female. It's really bad to be most males. So at the extremes, it's better for, it's, you know, it's great to be that top male, but almost no male is the top male, in which case it's really bad. From the female perspective, it's good uh, for almost all of them. So this leads to these differences lead to, sorry, you still want It's going to lead to a lot of differences in males and females, how they behave, how they think, how they feel. You'll see what we're getting at, that high investment is going to lead to choosy females. We started with that, thinking about that, that casual sex study. We weren't surprised at all, but we're kind of getting there to figure out why, why would that be? Why, why would females be so much more choosy? Why would be, males be more indiscriminate? So among mammals, first question we could ask is this, how can a female mammal maximize her reproductive success? Our assumption is that natural selection is leading to an increase in the prevalence of individuals who have behaviors that are designed to maximize their reproductive success. Whatever genes cause that are going to be well represented relative to alternatives. So can they invest heavily in their offspring? Yes, that's a good idea. The more a female invests in her offspring, particularly among mammals, because they tend to be very altricial, the more likely they are to survive. In order to have reproductive success from an evolutionary perspective, you have to have offspring that survive. You can't just produce them and uh, let them all die, because then that doesn't matter. They don't, they don't count for you. Can she gain access to lots of resources? Yeah, that's an important thing, because the more food she gets, the more reproductive success she's going to have. The healthier she is, the healthier her offspring are, the healthier they are, the more likely they are to survive. In the case of the elephant seal, how does she gain access to lots of resources? By mating with the male who controls the beach. Then she gets a nice place where she can rest and stay safe. Does she maximize her reproductive success by mating a lot? No. No, we already saw that with the fruit fly study. Same thing for the uh, uh, human or an elephant seal, female elephant seal, if she goes and mates with another male, not going to help her. So the answer is no. And let's contrast this with what goes on for the males. So here's where it gets tricky. A male is going to have higher reproductive success, all else being equal, if he can help take care of the offspring. The more likely they are to survive, the more likely uh, he's going to have reproductive success from them. You can see I have the answer here is no. Why would the answer be no if I've just told you that if he invests in them, they become more likely to survive? Females do as well. Still, even having his care improves their chances. What's my second favorite economic concept? Opportunity cost, yes. If he's investing heavily in the offspring, he's not investing as heavily as he could be in getting additional matings, each one which can turn into uh, reproductive success. If he controls access to lots of resources, like that top elephant seal, yes, that is an important thing to do. And finally, mate a lot, yes. 
So a big difference here is going to be what we already saw, that there's going to be strong selection for males to want to mate a lot, to invest slightly less in their offspring. And it's not just opportunity costs here that cause me to write no. What's the other reason? You don't know if the kid's yours, paternity uncertainty. So the combination of opportunity costs plus paternity uncertainty is selection for reduced investment by males relative to females. We can summarize these in either one general rule of economics or two predictions. Economics, if you've taken it, will tell you this. Those who have valuable resources, don't give them away. We're going to see how this is relevant to reproduction in mammals in just a second. What's the valuable resource that we've been talking about so far in terms of having reproductive success? Investment. Well, gametes, yeah. Uh, you just have to make investment. So you have to make a big gamete. You have to take care of it through gestation. You have to take care of it through lactation. And who's making that investment? The females are. So we can make two predictions here. The first is this. The sex that invests more tends to be more discriminating. They're not going to give it away. Because they are investing more, they don't want to mate with just anyone. They've got something of value. They can hold out for the best options. Our second prediction will be this. The sex that invests the, uh, less is going to have to compete amongst themselves for access to the other sex. Parenthetically, I say they're going to seek greater paternity certainty as well. Because to the extent that offspring are going to do better if they get parental investment, it is good for the male to provide some, some care. But it's this delicate balance between when is it better to search for additional matings, and by better, I just mean in terms of reproductive success, and when is it better to take care of your offspring. But this is a serious difference in strategies that we expect. One sex, in most cases, this is going to be the female, are going to be more discriminating. If a female makes a bad choice, she chooses to mate with an, a male elephant seal who's really lame. He's small, he controls no resources. Uh, if she makes that bad decision, that's really bad for her, right? The cost of the bad decision She's now pregnant with offspring of this bad male. They might be small genes, weak genes, uh, non-aggressive genes. She's going to pass on all these bad features to her offspring. And if he's really a low-quality male, he's probably not going to take care of them as well. Uh, and so you end up just with, it's a big, big mistake. On the other hand, if a male makes a uh, bad decision and chooses to mate with a low-status female, what's the cost of a bad decision? Almost nothing. So we see that we expect one sex to be really discriminating, the other to be not so discriminating. We saw that in that initial casual sex study, right? Males will say yes uh, to almost anyone who asks that question, 75%. Females are not going to uh, because that's not how the, the best quality males are going are gonna to get them. Uh, and then on the flip side here, that we expect to see competition. So it doesn't surprise us that we see the male uh, elephant seals all fighting with each other to get access to the females. We don't see the females competing with each other because they can all have access to whoever they want. Do they wait in line for the biggest male? More or less, yeah. Yeah. So if we look at our, our predictions now in a little bit more detail, we're going to see this, that the more investment, the more discriminating. So that's a prediction that we get just from considering the, uh, the, the inequity in investment. What we might expect are things like this. We might expect females to demand honest signals of health. In other words, I'm not mating with you unless I know that you are a healthy uh, male. 
I'm going to go through a lot of, a lot of data on these. Let me just show you uh, three of uh, our big predictions. They're going to value fighting ab ability, and they're going to wait and see, all okay, right, which male is better. And they might do things like uh, in investing, eliciting, sorry, a commitment to invest. So classic example of this would be the grebe, G-R-E-B-E. -E. And the grebe is a type of bird where when the female is trying to decide who she's going to mate with, what she does is she has the male, uh, he'll sort of come close to her and he'll make, make his intentions clear. And then what she will do is she'll fly along the water uh, like she's doing here, sort of paddling her legs, almost like she's running across the water. And the male has to go right behind her, and he has to do exactly what she does. And then she stops, and then she goes straight up, and the male has to go straight up with her, and then she dives down, and she'll kind of hover across the top of the water. He has to do it right behind her. She goes on like this for about two weeks, and the male just follows her and does everything she does, and she'll curve her head like this, and he'll do the same thing. And when you watch it, it, you know, it's like they're doing, you know, a figure skating competition or something. But what she's doing is she's not mating with him. She's deciding whether or not he's good enough to mate with. And so it's called the courtship dance. If after two weeks he's still there and she thinks that he's doing a good job, she's collected some data on him. She thinks he's pretty healthy. And why does she think that he's maybe committed to investing in the offspring that they have? She wants to make sure that they don't mate and then he takes off. Now, how does she know that that's less likely? Because what are his options after he leaves her? He can't just mate with someone else, right? Because all the females are like, no, you know, we're doing the dance for two weeks. <laughs> and so from his perspective, it's like, well, all right, well, my options are do the dance again for two weeks or just take care of this baby maybe that, that is mine. Uh, and so it's a pretty good strategy that the females have. They get this commitment to invest. Uh, and that turns out to be a pretty good way to, way to do it. We've also got uh, some other species. This is, uh, this is something called uh, a bowerbird. And what the bowerbirds do is this is a male, and he takes all these uh, pieces of grass, dried grass, and he creates a little hut. And then he takes feathers, and he puts them all around uh, the outside, to make it look real nice. And it looks like, yeah, it looks like kicks, I think, all around it. Uh, I don't know. But so he's made this little house. The females then come by, and they check it out. And they look at it, and they'll walk around, and he kind of stands in front of the house, uh, you know, is thinking, pick me, pick me. And if she does, they go in the little house, and they will mate. And they tend then to stay together for a while. If she doesn't, he sits there, he waits for another female to come by, and he'll usually fix up the house a little bit more. She comes by, um, he hopes she, that she'll pick him. If she doesn't, usually what happens is that if a few females come and nobody picks it, it's the saddest thing. He smashes down the house, <laughs> and he starts over again, and he tries to build it a little bit nicer. And it's sad because uh, certain top males do get more females choose him, and so there are some males, they build a bunch of houses and never, ever uh, get selected. So uh, we have a third category. I don't know if I, I don't have the picture of this. Now we'll, get, we'll come back to the ponies here. But nuptial gifts, uh, there is something called the hanging fly. And in the hanging fly, what happens is the female will only mate with the male in these insects if he brings her an insect, a dead insect that she can eat. And so what he'll do is he'll come to her and he gives her the insect, but he doesn't let go of it. He holds on. So she starts eating it while he's still holding it. Uh, he starts mating with her. And he will, only, he will only let her eat the food if she mates with him. She will only mate with him if he's giving her food to eat. And so it literally goes on. And the bigger the piece of food is, and sometimes they'll have things almost the size of their body, the longer he gets to mate with her. The longer he mates with her because they, they lay eggs and he's fertilizing them, the longer they mate, the more offspring are his. And so in the case of these, it's called a nuptial gift. 
uh, that you know she's demanding that because this is a good one because if he takes off after they mate, it doesn't matter. Like, oh no, now I'm not going to get any investment from this guy because she already got the investment. So what the males will do is, in a lot of cases, they'll take the, the insect that they catch and they'll wrap it up in these elaborate uh, you know, coverings of various things. Uh, and people have argued multiple reasons why they might do this. One is that it looks bigger. So if I show up you know, and I'm carrying this giant dead insect, you're going to think, hey, that's a pretty good nuptial gift. I'm going to get a huge amount of nutrients, but she's got to eat through to, to get it. It maximizes the amount of time that they're mating for. The other thing that's funny is that after she stops mating with him or after a period of time goes by, uh, what happens is frequently the male will decide, okay, that's enough. He takes the food with him and then he'll go, he'll go search for another female with his half-eaten piece of food. If, if you're a hanging fly female, don't go for the guy who's got a half-eaten fly um, because, yeah, you're getting less of an investment. But uh, anyway, so these are some of the behaviors that we would predict would happen in species. And then we go out and we look to see if these, these predictions are true. Um, I had value fighting ability as well. In many species, we see that uh, females will only mate with the male that wins the battle. So the elephant seals were probably the best case example of that, but we see it in horses. Uh, we have here a red deer, and under demanding honest signals of health, females prefer males that have the biggest antlers. So here we have multiple females, and we have a male that's got very big antlers. The antlers are really costly to produce, and for that reason, if a male has big ones, it means that he's got whatever the health, the energy to produce them. And so it's called an honest signal because you can't fake it. We expect females uh, to really value things that are honest signals. And by honest signals, I just mean something you can't fake. I'm trying to think of what would be examples, try and come up with ways that males might try to get a female to mate with them or be interested in them that are not honest. What's that? A Porsche. A Porsche? Now, why do you say it's not an honest signal? How much does a 911 cost? 80 About 80 grand. Uh, and so most people would say, ah, that's a pretty honest signal. But how could it be? But not in terms of genes. Ah, they're very, very correlated. It's a good example, though, because what might the male do? He might know that if, if he is trying to attract females and he drives, drives a Porsche, it's going to increase his probability, right, of getting her. But let's say he's a relatively low-status male. How can he do this? How can he get this signal? He could rent one, yes. Or he could buy a Boxster, right? A Boxster, how much is that? 43 grand. And <laughs> Boxsters are for sissies. Uh, because there's this perception that, aha, you're trying to get the value of the name, but uh, it's not the actual honest signal. So there's this battle going on all the time, uh, not just in humans, but in every other species where the females want honest signals and the males want, uh, the males want to figure out how can they get uh, more credit than they deserve. So as, as a female, you want to think about, all right, well, I want a car, uh, maybe a car. I'm trying to think of things that, are, that cannot be faked. Like, what are things about a guy that might really impress you? They tend to be the things that can't be faked. Because, what's that? Good credit? <laughs> really? What, are you running a credit report on your, your suitors? Wow. All right, what else might there be? Muscles, uh, height. Height tends to be a good one in terms of, of health, requires lots of nutrition. What else? What's that? Muscles can be faked. Very tough to fake them, uh, but, but how could you fake them? Yeah, you could maybe have on more shirts, bulky shirts or something like that. All right, well, I want you to think about that, that idea of, of honest signals and all that. And so uh, signals that tend to be good signals are exactly the ones that you tend to see uh, people trying to, to cheat. One of the things I read about that I thought was really crazy but not surprising is that the Harvard Registrar's Office 
uh, is the office that if someone is applying for a job and they've written on their resume, you know, I got my PhD at Harvard, I was an undergrad there, uh, you can call and say, okay, I've got, someone says, you know, they, they went there. Uh, what percentage of people, when they get calls, this is Harvard's office, what percentage of the calls where someone has claimed a Harvard degree are from people who have no, no affiliation whatsoever with Harvard? 33%, one out of three. How crazy is that? How many people are putting Santa Monica College on who didn't actually go there? Probably significantly fewer because the value you're getting, you know, that's a signal where uh, you're not getting value out of faking it. But with Harvard, by putting it on there, you can get great things by saying you went there. And so it's a signal that it's somewhat of an honest signal, uh, but, you know, it's still something then that people are going to try, try to fake. There was someone who was, a few years ago, this made me so happy, a woman had been elected mayor of West Hollywood, and LA Weekly did this whole story on her, and they noticed in, in all of her interviews when they talk about, she, she put herself forth as a UCLA graduate. Uh, but if you read closely, she, someone would say, oh, so you graduated from UCLA. She would say, yeah, I went to UCLA. And her words were always a little bit cagey, and so they, they, they started to you know, look at more and more interviews, and they started to, to have people come and ask her questions. Finally, they found out that she hadn't gone to UCLA. She had gone here to summer school uh, for a couple of terms, and she started putting on her resume that she had a UCLA degree, trying to, to fake that signal so she could get stuff. And she ended up having to resign from, uh, from office for, for lying about that. But I mean, that's good, right? You're working very hard for the degree. You don't want someone else getting credit for it. That's why something like this, where you've got the rack of antlers. How do you fake a rack of antlers if you're another male red deer? You can't. So that is a really good, honest signal. You can only produce them if you have the qualities that they are advertising. Same thing here. We have some buffalo uh, fighting ability. Here we have a couple of uh, big orange sheep, I think they are. Female over here waiting to see which one of these survives banging their heads together for a while. Uh, and she will mate with the male who turns out to be the top uh, male. I'll go back. Anyway, one last little bit of data. This is kind of a screwy looking graph, but it makes a point that doesn't surprise us. It's similar to what we were talking about before. And it should be, I feel like they should have uh, produced it the opposite way. It says this, it says, how long has a couple uh, been going out together? What's the likelihood that they're going to have sex with each other? So for a long, 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 long time, here's why it's, it's bad, because the axis is reversed. If they've been together for five years, green is male, brown is female, equal probability they, they're both going to consent to, to have sex with each other. But as soon as it becomes less time than that, if we're talking about two years, much higher probability that the, the male is going to consent to have sex. If it's one year, it becomes even more. Big gap here. You get down to six months, it becomes very large. At any time interval, longer than five years, males are more likely to say yes to intercourse than females. So I want you to think about that. What is the cost of making a bad decision? If you're the female, it's very high. If you're the male, not very high. This will be our third take-home message. Given that female reproductive investment is initially higher, by that I mean the gamete is bigger, gestation is female-dominated in mammals, lactation is solely female in mammals, that means they're vulnerable early on because there's an asymmetry in their investment. Therefore, given that they're investing more, they're going to hold on to it and make sure they don't make a bad choice. They're going to de demand investment in the form of the nuptial gift or the courtship behaviors. Do we see anything like that? Nuptial gifts, courtship behaviors among humans? Engagement rings? That's one version of a giant insect wrapped up, right? The bigger it is, the better, yes. That's also part of uh, courtship rituals as well. Signs that there's going to be some commitment. The wedding itself. But I want you to think about this because humans don't fit exactly into this, right? Because if we were the same as elephant seals, 
Do you think that the elephant seal, seal females are worrying a lot about fashion and things they can do to make themselves attractive to the male? No, not at all. He will mate with any female who's on the beach. But in humans, we don't get that. We see that not only is there male-male competition for females, there's also some female-female competition for males. So why would it go backwards the opposite way? I want you to think about that because I gave you two rules. The sex uh, predictions we made, what did I call them? Sex behavior predictions. Sex that invests more will be more discriminating. So there is just a relationship between how much you invest and how discriminating you are. I'm going to stop here for the day because there's a whole bunch that we're going to talk about the flip side males. Uh, so be sure and come on on Thursday. We've got some crazy data I'm going to show you. I'll see you then.